Welcome to V is for Victory, a podcast about how small businesses overcome big battles. I'm your host, Jill Miller of Vera Creative, a boutique marketing firm in the Chicagoland area where I'm also a part-time professor of an advertising course. Join me as I talk with entrepreneurs about the challenges they face as well as their strategies for success. Hi, everybody. Welcome to V is for Victory. We are in episode 40, and I am super excited to be joined today by Sergio Rojas, a great friend of mine from way back in the day. Do you realize we go back 20 years at least? Because I, I knew you when I was using a fake ID to get into bars. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love the reference point to, uh, to dating that. Yeah. yeah. Sergio, you have quite the resume. Let me tell you what I know without doing any research or catch up um, whatsoever. I remember you owned Redefined Fitness in Chicago. I know you worked um, at the White House. Yeah. Um, under the Obama administration, which I have for years, I've literally been dying to ask you questions about that for years. Like I think about it. <laughs> um, and then I follow you on Instagram and I saw that you have recently wrote a book that, that is titled Say Goodbye to Belly Fat. And I was like, I got to have you on my show because I got to have, I got to have you promote this book. So let's take a few steps back and just Tell me, you know, where your journey begins. Take me as far back as you want, um, where your journey begins and, and how this book really came to fruition. What was your history, your background, your credentials, whatever you want to talk about. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Jill. Um, so let's go way back. Um, as a teenager and in my early 20s, I dealt with a lot of um, anger issues, depression issues, and I turned to alcohol and drugs. Um, and, and then I think that I was very successful in school. I always had jobs. I played sports, um, but there was an underlying sadness and depression and anger within me. And I think it's because my dad struggled financially so hard. He'd gotten taken advantage of in business every time he tried to start a business. Um, you know, and he moved to the United States when I was a baby, um, didn't speak English. He was a busboy, a waiter, didn't have any education. So kind of that stuff brought me just a lot of frustration and anger. And um, I was going to college very part-time because I didn't want to go into debt and in Chicago. And I remember walking across the mirror one time and I'm like, I have man boobs. I got cellular around my ribs. My belly is chunky. And I'm like, what the heck happened to me? And I was only 24, 25 years old. And I said, I got to change. And the next day I went to a gym. I did a fitness challenge. And I said, I'm going to stop buying alcohol, stop buying drugs, and I'm going to go sober for three months during this fitness challenge. And I'm going to reward myself with a motorcycle because the motorcycle is something I dreamed about as a kid. And it's going to take away all my stress and anger, and it's going to bring me happiness. And so I bought a motorcycle and I'm riding on Lakeshore Drive. I lost 25, 26 pounds, cut my body fat in half. I felt great. And I thought that's what made me happy. And as I'm riding late that night, my first night I had the motorcycle it clicked. I'm like, you know, I actually hadn't been angry or depressed for several months. And it was the lifestyle change. And that was when I first kind of woke up to like, wow, this health and fitness stuff has, it's, a more, it's more than just what your body looks like. And as I started looking around, so many people were not just unhealthy physically, I just realized how unhappy they were. And there's just too many people struggling physically and emotionally. So I called my brother up and said, hey, I need to become a personal trainer to help pay for college instead of waiting tables, doing artwork for musicianing and managing bands, which I think you met me when I was managing ma bands, right? Yep. <laughs> I would have so, been that And I love, <laughs> I'm an artist. I love music and I love being around music and I draw and paint. So um, it, was, it was beautiful and I loved it, but it just wasn't paying the bills and causing me to party too much. So I decided to get certified as a trainer. And again, I, it's funny because by the time I became a certified trainer, I had gained all the weight back that I'd lost in a fitness challenge. I'm like, what the heck? So I got focused again. And over the first five, seven years of my career, I gained and lost weight multiple times and I couldn't figure it out. And I, I got introduced to a couple of doctors that were very, very holistic and just had a very different language than I had already had two nutrition certifications at the time, um, which actually had conflicting information. So I was already, again, more confused, but these guys were just talking very differently. And they really talked about insulin and how insulin was connected to our gut health, our mental health, 
our immune system, um, to our thyroid and our hormone function, to brain and cognitive stuff. I was like, what? So how do we learn to master this stuff? And then they talked about how complicated it was and you needed these con continuous glucose monitors and how everybody's gut health is different. So it's different for everybody, how somebody can have three cookies and their insulin stays normal. Another person has, most people have three cookies and their insulin spikes like crazy, right? Um, so I started doing further research on how we can identify what are the symptoms of um, insulin and how does our body respond to it um, without having a continuous uh, blood glucose monitor, which by now actually they're over the counter. Back then they were, you had to get a prescription. So um, when I finally followed their teachings and found a system that worked for myself, I lost another, I again, lost about 22 pounds that time, cut my body fat in half and I felt good. And that was 14 years ago and I've never gained it back. Um, I started teaching it to my clients and it started going really well. Um, I just had clients that were losing 30, 40, 60 pounds with me, but I would catch them two years later and they were losing another 40 or 50 without me. And that had never happened to me in my career before. I used to help people lose 40, 50 pounds and run into them two years later and they gained it all back. I'm like, what happened? That's totally what I thought you were <laughs> going to say. So, yeah. <laughs> so, that, I mean, that was the majority of my career in the beginning. And, and that's why I just, I struggled with it. I'm like, I can, I know I can help you lose weight. I just don't know how to help you keep it off. And when I really started learning all these practices and mindful habits and their micro habits that you connect to your living and that are connected to your insulin, that really made it was a game changer for me. And then I got hired uh, by a trucking company that said, Hey, we need somebody to help build a wellness program for truck drivers. I'm like, oof, okay. And I was consulting for them. They, they wanted me in house. So we moved to Iowa from Chicago. Um, and I started studying truck drivers, their lifestyle and used these same principles. And lo and behold, I mean, we helped over 700 truck drivers, um, I would say probably a hundred of them got off their medications. Um, I talked to quite a few of them still, uh, and they've lost, they've continued to lose weight. And I just knew that if a truck driver that spends 14 hours sitting, uh, their options for food is very limited. Mm -hmm. Their time is so restricted and they can lose 50, hundred pounds and keep it off and get off medications that anybody could, there's no excuses. So that's when, when the pandemic came and my contract with the trucking company had ended. Um, I knew that, okay, I got I to gotta buckle down and write this book. So that's, that's what happened. And here, here we are. <laughs> so, well, I'll work maybe backwards a little bit. So was that a specific trucking company then? Like that seems, it seems weird. I don't know. Just, it's kind of shocking to me that somebody would narrow in on that demographic truckers who, who identified the issue and it, if it was a particular company, I feel like they've really set themselves apart in the industry by hiring you and helping their employees in that way. Yeah, I, so it is. Um, a friend of mine, when I worked at the White House, um, I had done some projects with, you know, they, they had me talking with sports teams and youth programs. So we did a program with the YMCA of Chicago and the, um, and the Chicago Bulls. And a woman who was head of the Y in Chicago at the time ended up becoming the head of the YMCA in Dubuque. And she would meet all the CEOs in her capital fundraising. Um, and this truck, this trucking company asked her for a wellness program. Hey, it's like, I need, I, my drivers need to be healthier. And she's like, well, you don't need me. The, well, the Y is like, oh, you need my friend Sergio. <laughs> so that's how I got introduced to them. And um, that's how they brought me in. And there are a couple of the trucking companies that have added wellness because it's, it's become a desperate situation. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think they're using the right model. Uh, mm -hmm. One company in particular just does a three month fat loss program and it's high intensity exercises for truck drivers. It's really about cutting out carbs. And I, I just think that's again, the wrong approach because everybody I know that's cut out carbs eventually goes back to them and gains all the weight back plus more. Yeah. <laughs> <All right? laughs> yep. So um, yeah, they, they're very forward thinking. We built the program. They have a couple of coaches that they kept on because my contract was to design the program and go back out and work for other companies. I've been hired uh, multiple times by the Federal Highway Traffic Safety Association, which is really cool. Um, they have a nonprofit called NETS, which is Network for Employers of Traffic Safety. And I've spoken at their conference a couple of times as a keynote speaker. I've consulted to help build their wellness portal for, for companies that have drivers. So yeah, it's been a, it's been a great thing to see 
um, a little bit more attention and conscientiousness towards caring for truck drivers because they, if, if once you start to learn about what they do for a living and the sacrifices they make, um, my heart pours out to them. And I, I used to get mad when truck drivers would cut me off. And I'm like, why? Because it's going to take them three minutes to pass the next truck. But they get charged for gas mileage. And if they hit the brakes, it slows down and the gas mileage goes way down. And, and again, with all the sacrifices they make, I always open my open the lane up for a driver. It's, yeah, yeah. Um, well, kudos to you for acknowledging that and seeing that. Um, and yeah, that that's amazing. And you're right. I agree. What a hard job. And it's kind of like, would you want to do it? You know, <laughs> listeners, would you want that job? No, then stop complaining. Um, <laughs> how did how did you get hired by the White House? What did that look like? I know you moved your family, right, to D.C.? Yeah, it was time. actually, yeah, it was a really short stint because yeah. I didn't realize. It's interesting when when Obama was um, running for president, I just Googled the words fitness, nutrition and White House. And then the President's Council on Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition came up. And I'm like, oh, that sounds cool. And they have a board. And the board meets at the White House once or twice a year. And then they do like, you commit to like six events a year. Um, and you travel and you go speak on wellness and things like that. It's a non-paying job. Well, lo and behold, when I started applying for it, I didn't realize I was applying for the executive director position. I thought I was just applying to be on the board. <laughs> And um, after my second interview, I realized this is a real deal. They actually really <laughs> like me and, um, and want me there. Um, so I couldn't say no to the job. I took the job. Uh, but what I realized after being there for four months in DC was that because I had a gym and we were managing three corporate sites, I had to close it down. And any stocks that I owned in fitness and wellness, you'd have to sell, even if it's mm. at a loss. And they say a lot of people take a loss. Because of financial. conflict of interest or exactly. what? Exactly. Because it's Interesting. an appointment. Yeah. Interesting. Because there's plenty of conflicts of interest in the oh White my House gosh. presently. Hmm. Yeah. And, and I, I'm like, <laughs> and you get crazy security clearance. I mean, they did the biggest background FBI check on me. They, and they gave me pretty deep security clearance, which is fantastic. And I loved it. Yeah. Um, but, they, you know, they just said, hey, you have to make a choice. And they gave me two months. So I was there for six months. Um, it was an honor. It was a blessing. Um, no matter what you think of the politics and policies, I, I will say one thing because we're going to talk about politics for two seconds here. <laughs> no matter what side you're on, left or right, the extreme of both sides are whack jobs, right? You, you've got you to let go of the extremities. The middle path has more wisdom, but no president has the power to do what you think they do. When yeah. I stepped into the position, um, the woman who was acting in my position is a career politician. She works... Um, I forgot what department she works in. She was in, in the Navy and stuff like that, but fantastic woman. She's the godmother to George W., one of, his, one of their daughters. And says, Sergio, whatever you hear about George W., I can only tell you him and Laura are one of the kindest people on the planet. And some of the stuff that the news is saying about him, he didn't even have a chance or control about. Mm, There's a machine yeah. in politics, right? Yeah. Money, corporations. Right. And so whatever people think about Obama, don't think he made all those decisions. There's a machine. Yeah. Um, I can say that he's a an amazing human being, deeply caring. Um, he comes from, you know, community activism. So does he have all the financial wherewithal to, to run the way, run it as a business the way a lot of Republicans would? No, but, um, but he's a good person and, and cares deeply. And I think George W. is probably very much the same. I think he's a really caring person. I think his dad was more connected to the machine than he was and stuff. But Outside of that, the middle path, baby, it's way more, <laughs> way less drama and a lot, <laughs> yeah. more, a lot more truth, the middle yeah. path. Yeah, you know? I hear you. Okay, let's go back one more time. Yes. Your dad got a little swindled in business, but you have been very successful. So what did you learn by his mistakes? Would you say, were you too young at the time? Were well, let's, you... let, let me be clear on, on success and, and, and stuff. So, um, my dad had started three different businesses with three different partners. Actually, one of his partners was his cousin and um, his cousin even took advantage of him, but he never signed contracts. And my first business was a real estate partnership with two other business partners and we didn't sign contracts and I was not successful in that venture. Um, so I've, I've had my successes and my lack of success as well. Um, my gym redefined fitness while it did well, 
was nowhere near the, it was, there was a lot of challenging months and months that we lost money. Um, so out of the seven years I had that business, I would say three of them were extremely unsuccessful. Um, what, what saved that business and what really helped me a lot was the ability to get corporate wellness contracts and corporate management contracts. So we managed three corporate gyms, uh, which that was where the major success was. But um, I, I wasn't extremely, the, my own facility itself was, was a break-even kind of facility. It wasn't very, very successful. The, the business succeeded because we had the corporate wellness contracts right. and the corporate yeah. management contracts. Yeah. I have a client that's very similar to that. She has big contracts with um, her local high schools, actually. And that's really what helps the business a lot. And it is able to keep her membership prices down for her gym um, yeah. and afford, you know, really pour money back into the gym. So it's very similar. So, yeah, and that's interesting that you bring that up about contracts, because in the beginning of my business, I I um, had maybe a one page contract that was written by me or was nothing legally binding to it. Uh, and over the years, my contract grew and grew. And as you get screwed, you're like, well, wait a minute, I got better add that into my contract. And now nobody reads anyways, but at least it's there in writing and it is legally binding. I did have a, well, nothing, I guess, is legally binding. You can challenge anything, but you know, I did have a lawyer write it. So yeah, no, and especially, so, yeah. if, you have, especially if you have partners, you know, it's just, yeah. And within so, the so, business so. itself, I agree. Agreed. Yes. It's important to have um, the deals worked out. And sometimes you, you hate to, it's a delicate matter. You hate to bring that up because your family, you're supposed to trust each other or your friends, you know, but those are the hardest people to do business with. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you were actually too, I remember another thing that you did, you were a correspondent for like ABC, right? You were kind of their go-to health guy and, when and they B would do and, yeah, NBC. And, okay. NBC cool. in Chicago. Yeah. Cool. So um, funny. So again, I'm watching television one morning, this guy's doing this fitness segment on NBC and I'm actually at that time was training a camera guy and uh, um, another woman who was actually a producer for NBC. Um, so I asked them, hey, how do I get on? And they're like, well, this guy has a contract, so we can't get on, but you can try to go to the other networks. And I pitched the other networks and got on CBS once on WGN in Chicago and got a couple segments here and there. And then one day the producer goes, I'm sorry, the camera guy goes, hey, email this producer. They just fired the trainer that was on NBC because he was selling the segments from NBC to the airlines. <laughs> I was like, what? He was actually taking it like his own content. Oh gosh. <laughs> so he lost that contract and I went in there and they hired myself and two other uh, amazing fitness people and f dear friends of mine for life now, uh, Andrea Metcalf and Saran Dunmore. Uh, so the three of us became the NBC five fitness team and we would each have a segment, a weekly segment. Um, and that was, I love that NBC was really, you know, forward thinking with their health and their fitness and really promoting um, lifestyle. So we got to be on weekly for, I think, almost 11 years. Oh, that, oh, that's really long time. Yeah. yeah I guess I, I didn't realize that it lasted that long, but I don't watch the news. So yeah, I don't either. <laughs> I'm blissfully <laughs> ignorant. Um, and Dr. Oz, you tell me about that. <laughs> yeah. So they had a contest for, they wanted to do the Dr. Oz show trainer of the year. And I submitted my um, bio with a demo video and I got selected and then they brought us down from I, I can't remember how many they said like 6,000 applicants down to the top 20 and then the top 20 to the top four and so I was one of the semifinalists and didn't win but I got to be on the show a couple times to you know talk about my approach to health and wellness and how holistic it is uh, I don't want to complain but the, the, the way they did it and they, and they it was a technology tech screw up that they did and they admitted to it, but they couldn't do anything about it. Once it was set, it was set. You can vote a million times. Mm. Like you could just sit there and vote and vote and vote and vote. And I didn't tell anybody to do that. I thought just vote once. And right. I want to get a million <laughs> right. people to vote once. Right, right. So um, that, that was part of the reason that that went that way. But, you know, the, the person who won, I think she's amazing as well. She's a firefighter in Canada and a spectacular human being. So many blessings to her. And, and it was just a grateful, a grateful experience. And Dr. Oz and I built a relationship because of that. I mean, I've, I've done a couple of 5Ks with him where we were both emceeing uh, for, for charities. Uh, so it's been really, he's, he's a fantastic human being. He's now running for politics. And I, I hear people complaining about him, but 
again, I just know him as a human being in his heart. I'll stay away from the politics for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to go right back to the politics just for a second. All the times you were uh, public facing, were you ever told like, um, can't talk about that or there are certain things you can't say or, you know, we've got this big sponsor for this network and they don't want you touching on X, Y, Z. Was that any at all in your experience? So, you know, yes, in the news. Um, so when you're on the news and I'm trying to speak nutrition truths and some of the products I'm going to talk about, their, um, their marketing is healthy, but they're really unhealthy, are owned by some of the sponsors <laughs> that pay big money for commercials. And I was told multiple times that I can't do that. So I've had to refrain on there. Um, when it came to working for the White House, there were no real, I mean, mostly I was talking health and fitness stuff. The only one issue I had there was when at, at one time they were promoting, um, and it was the American Heart Association, and I think the White House was endorsing it as well, um, giving these green check marks to, to healthy foods um, when they were, low, because they were low fat. Ugh, yeah. uh, and in particular, like low fat yogurts are getting these big check marks, these cereals, because they were low fat, were getting check marks. And I'm like, hold on a second, folks, let's talk about... <laughs> insulin here and, Whole and, and, the, and the cause of diabetes and the cause yeah. of cancers and the cause of heart disease and the cause of obesity. It's insulin response. And when we're taking the fat out of natural foods and replacing with artificial sweeteners and fillers, you're actually spiking insulin even higher. And, you know, I talk about that in my book, how, you know, the eighties when we demonized fat is really the main culprit um, of the whole epidemic of obesity just exploding over the last mm -hmm. 35, 40 years. I mean, I talk about these when I do a lot of lectures. I'm like, you know, I'm 51 now. And when people are anywhere between the ages of 40 and older, I think if you think about high school, you know, even elementary school, junior high, there was one out of 30 kids that was obese, maybe two. Yeah. You know, um, it just, it just didn't exist. And then all of a sudden, you know, you ask a child now, or how many people knew somebody who had cancer back then? You know, it was really very rare. And if you ask people now, it's six out of 10 kids are overweight. Yeah. You know, yep. three out of 10 are obese. Scary, scary, scary thing going on. And I, I hope that people, and it's never body shaming. I have no problem with some belly fat, with some fat around the body. I think it's, it's a beautiful thing. I have no issues with it. It's just excess. Um, and if your energy is lower, um, if you can't sleep well, then you got to be mindful and pay attention to those things. So, right. Yeah. Yeah, I know agreed, I'm going agreed. on a tangent from your question. No, no, yeah, no. So I didn't you, get asked a lot of you, those things that were conflicting with, with the White House. I didn't have to tell you. Okay. Okay. So needless to say, we <laughs> you have the credentials, you've got the street cred, <laughs> your experience guy. <laughs> if anybody can write a book, it's you. <laughs> Although I do want to go back one more time. Did you go to India? Yeah, I've been to India a couple of times. <laughs> Can you talk to me um, about your, that was, was it like a yoga retreat? Yeah, I, or? I love, I love the variety of questions. Mm -hmm, for sure. Because, you know, I'm a, I'm a yoga teacher as well, but I've never been there. And I just, I'm just curious as to, do you have anything you can share about what shaped you while you were there? What really resonated with you? Well, yeah, let me tell you how I got there. Cause I think it's yeah. a really kind of funky and interesting story. Um, I was reading, I studied at Loyola university and I have, um, two majors and a minor, psychology and fine arts were my two majors. I wanted to be an art therapist, but I wanted to be a spiritual art therapist. So I added religion and theology as my minor. And in theology, we are learning Eastern um, religions. And I was studying a lot about Buddhism. And I was reading a book by the Dalai Lama. And one of my clients came in and she's like, oh, you're in, I'm like, well, I'm into all religions. I love theology and spirituality. And of learning about it um, a lot from looking for the, about the dilemma and she's like well the dilemma's youngest brother is coming to my house for dinner next in two weeks would you like to come i'm like really she's like oh yeah i'm like she's like i'm a, you know i'm a filmmaker i'm like yeah you told me you make documentaries but i didn't know you she's like yeah so his youngest brother's coming into town and he's gonna come on my house for dinner we have six of us for dinner you want to join us i'm like please so i get there and there's a franciscan monk named brother wayne teasdale late brother Wayne Teasdale, who passed away in 2004, but we built a really, really strong friendship. And he became my meditation mentor and teacher for many years before he passed. And he was diagnosed with cancer and him, and he's very, very close friends with the Dalai Lama and the Dalai Lama's youngest brother. And he had been diagnosed with cancer in his mouth 
So that's why TC Tenzik Chogyal had come to Chicago to just to visit him. So we're standing around at my client Valerie's house and she's like, or in uh, TC goes, Sergio, sit between me and this guy because these Catholics are crazy, you know? <laughs> and I sat between TC and, and Brother Wayne the entire night and the amount of Catholic Buddhist jokes all night long, we are peeing our pants laughing. It's just, these guys are nothing but love and humor. And so TC goes, Sergio, would you like to come meet His Holiness in India one day? I'm like, yeah, are you kidding me? And then Valerie and Brother Wayne said, yes, we're going in a few months. Why don't you come with us? I'm like, are you kidding me? So <laughs> um, we get to go to the Dalai Lama's home and they did about a two hour interview um, for the documentary. And then we spent about two or three hours just having conversation with him afterwards. And Were you nervous? No, 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 no. When you, when, I mean, you go through crazy security to go into his house and then you sit in a waiting room, this living room area where you wait, um, the vibration, I was excited. I wouldn't, mm. because I'd read so much about him and read his books. Um, but the vibration, like this wave that just gives you these goosebumps and this sense of peace. And about a minute later, he shows up. Mm. And doesn't keep you waiting. He's not like the doctor's joke. office. <laughs> no, you do wait a little bit. <laughs> but <laughs> okay. it's, it's, it's honestly, it's joke after joke after joke. And then into a 10 minute dissertation that blows your mind and opens oh. your heart up. And then to a joke, to a joke, to a joke. <laughs> and then to a 10 minute dissertation on some beautiful, peaceful thought. And then I was interviewed again. Uh, I got to go there again a second time because I was doing radio for WLUW in Chicago, which is the college radio station for Loyola. And I was invited to come and be, interview the Dalai Lama for my radio show called Peace Waves. Wow. So I got to go to his house a second time. And yeah, it's a, it's a pretty cool experience. Okay, now we'll go to the book. I could spend hours picking your brain. <laughs> You've had an incredible life. You're aware of that, right? Yeah, I am. Yeah. I'm, 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 you know, it, it, it has its challenges, but I've gotten to a point through all the meditation and prayer and, and just mindfulness that I love the challenges as well. You know, yeah. I think that, the last year and a half have been some of the most challenging times of my life. I lost, I had to close my gyms because of the pandemic, lost my corporate wellness contracts, lost my uh, gym management contracts. Um, because How ironic, to... right? How ironic. Yeah. We're in the middle of a health <laughs> crisis and let's abandon the one thing that keeps us healthy. So, yeah. Okay. Happier note, your book. So you've all went, or you've wanted to write a book. It's been on your... Oh, I've started. I've started probably the book three times. And each time it's shifted the, the focus and stuff and I kind of start the same, but then um, I started and stopped. I'm like, this isn't right. This isn't right. And, um, you know, through, through closing my business and, you know, ending my contracts, we decided to take eight months and just travel my wife and kids. Oh, nice. And we went to Mexico for a month, Colombia for a month, Costa Rica for a few weeks, Miami for a couple months. Um, and I've done a lot, a lot, a lot of meditation, a lot of, mindfulness, a lot of reading and learning. Um, and I kind of got a clarity on what I wanted to write about. And I knew that people were struggling with their stress and mental health and their weight gain during the pandemic. And I know people will just, you know, belly fat. I, I have belly fat issues, right? Um, I, I wanted to not be a vanity book. And, and I was qu questioning my title, but the subtitle is Six Steps to Mastering Insulin. Um, and losing weight for good, I, I thought would help people just get an understanding that this isn't just about, yeah. you know, a diet, because yeah. it's not a diet. These are micro habits and lifestyle things that through awareness, you have to learn how to process these little and go through these six steps. And it's going to be slightly different for everybody because we all have different microbiomes. So it's, I'm teaching people to pay attention um, to what's going on in their heart and their mind. And, um, and they're just following the six things that really help people master their insulin. Do you want to share them or do you want to them to people to read them in the book? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I could talk about them in general. So it's, you know, there, um, there are different things. One is, is mindful eating. Mm. I think we eat unconsciously. Yes. Right. We, we, we order unconsciously. We react to a hunger signal in the body unconsciously. Um, whether we smell something, whether, um, it's a certain time of day because that's, and we're not really paying attention to, are we really hungry? Because sometimes we ate an hour and a half ago and it could have been a pretty big meal, but all of a sudden I get the signal, like, oh, I want some bread or I want some cookies or chocolate, or I want pasta. I'm hungry again. I don't know why, but I'm hungry. 
And it's not, it's insulin, mm -hmm. you know, uh, pumped your, and brought your blood sugar levels low. So your body's saying, Hey, I need some kind of sugar to, to normalize the blood sugar levels, but it's not really hunger. So if you went and had a cup of warm tea, like I'm having now, um, if you took a few minutes and took a walk or stretched, uh, and then ask yourself 10 minutes later, am I really hungry? Or is it just a reaction to certain stimulant? Um, that made me believe I'm hungry or give me a false signal. And then when we eat, while we eat, you know, we're in a hurry. How many people eat stressed in a hurry or while they're working? Mm -hmm. And my, my business partner and colleague, uh, Dr. Novick, she's a, re a massive researcher, got a couple PhDs, had to do research on stress. And one of her studies was looking at feces and poop. <laughs> and she could tell who was stressed. <laughs> And who was it <laughs> wow. by, by, undige by undigested food? Oh, yeah, that you know, makes sounds sense. Like a great project, right? It oh. is. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But um, but it really it gives, you know, insight to it. So if we were more conscious and mindful while we eat, then we know when to stop. We know what food is serving us. I mean, we're hardwired for survival we're, and, and we're spiritually wired to thrive. Right. So our, our animal brain, the, the, the original brain of ours is all wired for survival. So if we are mindfully, and I teach the tr tr truck drivers, I'm like, if you want a bacon double cheeseburger with fries and a soda and a shake, go for it. Mm -hmm. But now do it mindfully. Mm -hmm. I teach them a meditation with a tangerine. And we do this meditation where we eat really slowly. We look at it. We think about the origin of it, peel it slowly, chew slowly, and all in silence. And at the end, we ask, how, what was it like? And they're like, oh my God, that's the best tangerine I've ever had. <laughs> I didn't realize right. they were this refreshing. Or yes. Right. Yes. I'm like, cool. I go, so if you want to do that with a bacon double cheeseburger, go for it. And you do it. And we all need salt, sugar, fat, and calories. So those first two or three bites are nourishing your body. But past that, I mean, that's they have so much salt, sugar, fat, and calories. In a you few don't bites. even taste anything past that, <laughs> really. <laughs> right. right. Like, so you don't need any more. And, and I had truck drivers come back to me and say, Sergio, this is crazy. He's like, I used to eat two double cheeseburgers. Now I only eat a half of one and I don't even get them every day. I used to get them every day. Now I get them once or twice a week. I'm like, perfect. Yeah. How do you Aww. feel? So much better. I didn't yeah. know I could, I, I'm <laughs> sleeping better now. I don't even, I don't even need my cups of coffee or my, I don't need my monster anymore. I just drink one cup of coffee and I'm great. I'm yeah. Like, beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it's all about. So that's, that's one of my, my first step is mindful eating because it's all about awareness. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and then the third part, there's three parts of mindfulness. It's pre-meal, during meal, and post-meal. And in post-meal, pay attention. Does the food give you more energy or less energy? Mm -hmm. does it Eat from have, cause. Give, does it give you mental clarity or does it give you mental fogginess? Does it cause you to bloat or do you feel normal and satiated? Yeah. And those are things that are giving you a sign of what you're eating is nourishing and beneficial to you or not. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, people don't realize this, but broccoli, which is one of the healthiest foods on the planet, somewhere between 10 and 15% of people don't digest it well. Mm. So it's not really good for them, especially raw. So they definitely have to cook it. Mm. And some people don't do well with even cooked broccoli. So um, it's paying attention to what works for you specifically. Um, the, the next step is getting your gut healthy. Uh, people don't realize that our gut health has what it really controls, not only our immune system, but it controls our mood, our brain, our cognition. Um, it's connected to what, how much food we or nutrients we absorb. So I give different steps on how you get your gut healthy. Um, I talk about macros, obviously proteins, fat, fiber, carbs, but I also add water and alcohol um, there as well because in fiber that we need to talk about. Um, but I think more importantly than what I really want to get across in that chapter is the prioritization should not be on your macro ratios. It should be on the quality of your macros because if you're eating 80% carbs, but it's, you know, quinoa and brown rice and lentils and vegetables and yeah. um, ancient grains, then you could eat 80 or 90% carbs and probably just fine. Mm -hmm. But if your 80% carbs comes from, you know, a muffin with breakfast, it comes from the sugar in your latte and it comes from croissants and it comes from pastas that are refined flour, then you're, you're, you're doomed. So look at the quality first and same as protein. People think that, Hey, I'm eating protein. Cause I'm going to, you know, Burger King and getting a chicken sandwich. It's got tons of protein. Well, let's look at what the bread's made out of. And then let's look at the chicken that's being served at a fast food restaurant. Um, how much hormones does it have in it? What was the lifestyle of that chicken? You know, so, you know, really looking at 
resources for getting wildly raised chickens uh, or wild turkey or you know venison bison you know mm. anything that's wild is a hundred times better than um, anything that's farm raised mm. and a friend of mine uh, she actually has helped me a lot uh, through kind of like uh, muscle testing she actually spent 17 years studying to help her daughter who was really really ill um, has a book called the wildatarian diet mm. uh, and okay. i and i highly suggest it so yeah, yeah. we use a we use a muscle tester too doctor yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so macros, fasting, I talk about fasting. Um, fasting is probably one of the most underutilized and most powerful tools to managing insulin to, I mean, it, 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 Dr. Walter Longo wrote a book um, called, he has the Longevity Institute, and he, he did fasting for cancer patients before chemo and how much more impactful and how much less chemo people need wow. uh, when you do fasting beforehand. Um, obviously, I talk about moving. Um, an exercise, but I teach it. I talk about it in a way that most people don't like to exercise. Let's keep it real in the field. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you know, we know that about 5% of the population really enjoy exercise and about 10% of the population um, actually exercises uh, on a regular basis. They say about 25 to 30% of the population exercises the minimal amount, but a really good amount is about 10%. But how many people love to move more youthful and pain-free and like to hike and cycle and swim and that stuff? So that's where we got to start. You know, just do four minutes twice a day, stretch, do a little bit of yoga, um, do a couple of squats, you know, anything to just get your body moving and ask yourself at the end of four minutes, do I feel better, same or worse? And that becomes internal. And that's what I taught to our truck drivers. And because I didn't say, hey, go do this 30 or 45 minute workout, um, because that's external, right? That's, that's a chore. Yeah. And we have to shift it from a chore to a gift. Mm. If it's a chore, we'll do it for a few months, sometimes just a few weeks, but it all 95% of us are going to give up on it. So we have to move. And then I talk about sleep and sleep is the number one thing that impacts all areas of our health. Uh, so those are the six steps, being mindful, eating, getting your gut healthy, managing your macros, um, fasting, moving and sleeping. <laughs> Uh, and where can people get the book right now? Yeah, so uh, the website is myforeverfatloss.com. Okay. People are asking me why I didn't put it on Amazon. Well, <laughs> that's a political question in some ways. Uh, you know, it's just funny, interesting thing. Jeff Bezos went to my high school. No well, way. I went, I, I went to his high school. I graduated uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> 10 years after him. Okay. I didn't realize this until just his. about three years ago, but three or four oh, years wow. ago. Um, you know, they just, there's no way to um, control a lot. Of, they control a lot of the stuff. They change the formatting in the ebook. Mm. Uh, it's hard to get, you know, to make even a couple bucks. And not that I'm here to make money with my book, but I, I'm using a part of the proceeds of my book to help with a couple charities. And I'm also using it to help uh, build a speaker series that I'm trying to get out there and, and lecture on on health and well-being so oh okay yeah it's funny because people, a lot of people do the reverse they're a speaker and then they take the content and they put it in the book yeah i've had yeah so that's that's interesting what about on socials where can people follow you uh vitality by sergio on either facebook or instagram and i think linkedin as well it's all vitality by sergio excellent branding <laughs> um but yeah so in the book what i did is i, I really made it a system thank you um, the, the system is, I, I added a bunch of bonuses with the ebook because I want people to not just read a book. Um, so I added a bunch of exercise videos, little four minute and 10 minute workouts you can do. I added a habit tracker. Um, I added functional squats. I added, you know, functional mobility exercises just to help people feel and move better right away. So I really wanted this to be a, a way people can get healthy and really take action versus just reading a book and then Okay, now how do it's I like start? It's like a workbook. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an ebook with a bunch of different bonuses that come along with it that you download. Um, if you want the paperback book, it's on that website as well. You can get the paperback as well. Great, great. All right, couple, just a few more questions. I won't take up too much more of your time. Do you still have that motorcycle? Listen, I'm having fun here. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, I definitely still have a motorcycle, but not that one I initially bought. <laughs> um, I, I bought a... Um, a 
not that anybody, not people can know, but a Yamaha FJ1200, which is kind of like a racing bike, kind of like those Ninja color bikes, um, because that was became available to me, and I was 23 or 24 at the time. Uh, I realized if I had that, that, that style of bike much longer, I would probably kill myself. And I always wanted a Harley. So my second bike was a, a Harley wannabe. Um, it was a Yamaha Roadstar, which was a beautiful bike. I bought it from a guy in California. And then I got a Harley, and then I had two Harleys. And then we sold one of the Harleys, and I have, I have a nice, beautiful um, Harley that I get to ride. And I can put a tank with a backrest on it for the, my kids. My kids love to ride with me, so... Yeah, I was going to ask journey. about your wife, Krista. Is that's she, her name, right? Yeah, she, she, she ride with you. <laughs> no, she wrote. She rode once with me in the city of Chicago, going to a street festival, and of course you're in traffic now. That's I go. This babe, this isn't a motorcycle ride. You got to yeah. really go and ride with me. She's still. She's saying she's getting the courage to, but the kids love it, and yeah, I, I love taking the kids out for a ride. My that's next, so I, I wanted to get a a motorcycle with a side cart so I could take both kids at the same time when they were small enough. Or the dog. Do you have a dog? Put him in there. <laughs> Be that guy cruising around. Yeah. <laughs> so funny looking. <laughs> I'll, I'll, still, I'll still get one. I'll get one too. <laughs> I love it. And okay, last question. Unless there's anything else you want to talk about, but I would ask you, what is your message right now for the world? What do, what do we all need to hear? I, so I was, I was going to talk about it just in regards to health, but it, it, it's regards to everything. I think self-love um, I think that our anger towards other people is a reflection of our self, our, our anger and frustration with the opposite perspective um, might be because a little of that resides in us. So we might know a little bit of its truth or for people to become healthy and make it a lasting thing where you really lose your weight for good and you don't have to deal with the stress and anxiety about what to eat or about not exercising, that kind of stuff starts with self-love. And I think that everybody has something that they judge themselves for uh, unless you do the real work and uh, the dalai lama said this to me the truth and the way the buddhists see it is that we're all created out of pure light and love that, that is our pure essence and our authentic energetic creation he goes and the reason we know that is because when we are honest and we're selfless and we serve and we help people there's a peace and harmony in our soul and our heart that we can never take away or deny on the contrary, when you lie, you steal, you cheat, you deceive, you have anger towards others, there's a disharmony or an uneasiness in your heart and in your soul that you can never deny. So based on that, we know that our true origin our, and our creator, um, our creative energy is pure light and love. And that's what we're all made out of. And I think people need to see that more and know that more and forgive themselves. If you've struggled with weight and you have no discipline and you have laziness when it comes to working out i promise you it's not your fault human nature is designed to be couch potatoes because <laughs> our right, think about it our origin we didn't know when we we're going to eat next yeah. human beings sometimes would go days without eating right so the goal is to conserve energy mm -hmm. so that's our hardwired in our brain we have to now change that so you're already at a disadvantage so don't blame yourself for it if you're struggling with food Trust me, you've been lied to by the food <laughs> industry and the diet industry for 50 or 100 years. Um, some of it was intentional, some of it's not. What I realize is that 90% of people market based on a small fraction of research, but they skip out the rest of it. Let me give you a quick example. Taking a statin, you know, is one of those research studies that, you know, I was taking a course with a guy named Dr. Michael Colgan, who's an amazing doctor out of Canada. And he was saying, you know, to us as students, the 17 of us that watch in a couple of years, they're going to be pushing statins. Um, and you're going to hear the doctors talk about it because all the research is really strong to helping you lower your cholesterol. What they're not going to share with you is that for people who take a statin for more than one to two or three years, now start to increase the risk of diabetes anywhere between 30 and 100 percent. And we were like, what? He's like, yep, that's clearly in the research showing that, but they're not going to talk about that because the cholesterol numbers are so strong and so good. Mm. What they also don't share is that we need cholesterol. If you stop the production of cholesterol, cholesterol is one of the most important um, fact for our bodies to function. So instead of stopping the production of cholesterol, and, I, and I'm sure it's needed for some people, their just genetics and their diet is so bad, but 
if we could change the diet, if we could start the walking and the exercising a little bit and stretching and, you know, eating the right foods, we can really make a huge impact on, you know, really lowering or changing the ratios of cholesterol is really what I'm trying to get at more than anything. So my whole point of this conversation is that I don't want people to blame themselves. I, I want people to forgive themselves and love themselves. And, and I think really caring for yourself and taking care of your health is our spiritual responsibility. It's we're, we're supposed to honor, nurture, and care for our bodies and minds, not abuse it. So take your health seriously. It's not as hard as you think, and it's more worth it than you think. Mm. Um, and it impacts the people around you. There's no way about it. So many people sacrifice their health to take care of others when that's actually doing more harm. So showing people that you take care of your body and your mind uh, is going to be a, a much more impactful way of being able to help people. One, because they model behavior and two, because you'll have more energy and focus and clarity on how to take care of them. Yeah. Beautifully said, Sergio, what a enlightening conversation <laughs> to say the least. Um, I can't wait. I want to have you on again and we'll touch on different topics. Um, but this has been absolutely great. I want to encourage listeners just to follow Sergio on social media check out the book. I agree. I think it's very hard to discern and shuffle through all of the media and the news and the noise and, and get to the truth. And it's, it's nice when we can have a trusted source that's done the research, because face it, a lot of people just will not take the time to do the research. They cling to the headline or the byline, um, but you've packaged it up in this nice um, book and ebook with all the value add. And um, I know a lot of people are going to be able to benefit from it and appreciate it. I'm certainly going to get my hands on it right after we hang up from this <laughs> interview. I can't wait. So, yeah, Joe, it was uh, such yeah. a pleasure catching up and, and yeah. talking to you. I think yeah. you're doing a great thing. And thank you. Uh, I love your energy. So I'm beyond oh, grateful for you. Likewise. Thank you so much for your time and for um, putting up with my technical difficulties. <laughs> I've had a few of those of my own. <laughs> All right, my friend. Take care. All right, take care.